Good afternoon everyone, welcome to the newly christened Level Up Lightning Talks. Oops, um, again, they're the same lightning talks you've been enjoying for the last don't know how many years, but <laughs> we've got a new name. Um, today we have uh, hopefully four speakers for you. Uh, we have um, Greg, Nikolai, Matt, but up first we do have Kirill talking crafting monoids in your software. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Here we go. Hey guys, so basically I'm going to be talking about the thing which happened a while ago. Uh, me and some other uh, people from Redgate went to Software Craftsmanship London conference and there was one talk which I particularly enjoyed, which was called Crafting Monoids in Your Software, which is about trying to simplify some complicated uh, jargon, I think, terminology such as monoids. For example, I have little idea what my, like, I'm struggling to understand, struggling to understand sometimes what monoids mean. I hope it's going to help you out as well. Um, yeah, so we can compare monoids to a glass of beer. So first of all, monoid is a set. So for example, a set of every glass of beer potentially in the world with a particular size. And then each monoid has an operation. So for example, you take one glass, you take another glass of beer, and you combine them together. Simple as that. And then if I take one element from the set and another one, the combination of two, two glasses of beer are still in the set. And then order does not matter. So for example, if I'm going to like add more glasses of beer on top of it, and I'm going to put like imaginary parentheses somewhere. It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same result, basically. And you can imagine there is a special glass of beer, which is, for example, an invisible one. And you can put zero beer there. And like when combining with any other glass of beer, the result is still going to be the same, just one glass of beer, which is called a neutral element. So what it means essentially that you have closure, you have a particular set, an element may belong to the set and may not belong to the set. You have the thing called associativity, so like order, like order does not matter. For example, in math, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, like it's the same as if you uh, combine 2 plus 3 and then 1 and 4. And a neutral element, which is 0, for example. And there are like lots of other examples which represent monoids uh, in real life as well, like lists, strings, you can combine them. There is a neutral element, for example, an empty string. Uh, in list, the neutral element is an empty list, and numbers, which I have already shown you. And there are lots of examples which represent the same basic idea. And yeah, composability. So composability is about combining, so like combining two glasses of beer. For example, group I and SQL. Um, like when approaching that, you need to think that monoids are not actually values, they're rather like value objects. They're immutable, like they hold a particular value. And like two objects are equal and they have the same value. And composability essentially, it's like a function which has no side effects, which is a very important thing, like no exceptions, nothing is being sent to any other remote RPC layer or anything like that. Like the function just takes a value that takes two values, like does something with them and returns a new value, which is still in the set as well. And obviously no exceptions. Uh, so for example, uh, imagine we have an, a payment cash flow objects, money and date, and the date should be the same. So uh, you, have a, you have a particular currency, you have a date, and you have a value, and you combine them and you get this. So for example, if the right, uh, right hand example is thrown an exception, this is not something that we can expect in monoids. And in order to avoid that, we can basically represent data differently. Uh, we can represent them as, uh, as a cash flow objects. Like instead of cash flow objects, we can define cash flow uh, sequences. And they're going to be combined by, uh, by equivalent dates, basically. 
So this is the thing called like object arithmetic. So it's all about kind of like redesigning the data in order to make it exception and bug free, uh, a little bit more declarative. And yeah, and there are quite a lot of other examples of object arithmetic, like ranges. You combine, for example, one, three, two, and four, and you get the range which encompasses them all. And uh, yeah, it's all up to you how you can arrange the data in order to make it like that. Uh, for example, averages. You, you cannot combine averages straight away, uh, like one average plus another average, but you can average the sum, but you can combine uh, two sums and then you can combine two counts to get a new average. So it's another way like, <coughs> of rearranging non-composable data, essentially. <coughs> uh, why is it useful? Well, it's kind of the way we think. It makes it more declarative. The code becomes its own documentation and uh, and yeah, uh, and I guess it's a uh, much more bug-free code, the same way we do it with a functional program, essentially. And yeah, this is basically like a very short extract from the one-hour talk, which is available on YouTube, which I found quite fascinating by Cyril Montreal, Crafting Monoids in Your Software, um, SCL Conf 2018. Like, uh, if you fancy, check it out. I think it's definitely useful and quite, quite cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Kirill. Yeah. yeah, so I was at that talk, very good. I think uh, Kirill's done a great job giving you a quick explanation. Do go check out the full video if you're interested, though I'd probably use mugs of hot chocolate, not beer. <laughs> um, but uh, next up we have Matt talking about how we use data uh, at Redgate Towers. Might have changed it. Yeah, I've changed things quite a lot. I'm, just... I'm going to apologise in advance because I'm going to be lame and read off a sheet to make this run to five minutes. Um, right, so hey all, um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the high level stuff around Regate's usage reporting system, um, so a bit about what it is, um, a bit about why it is the way it is, and hopefully some stuff you just didn't know. See, So the general aim is to be a consistent abstraction for all the ship tools so that they can send data back from the field. Um, Having a standard way means less duplication, uh, shared wins, and we can do things like cross tool analyt analytics. Um, and this way, Regate keeps control over its data by processing it and diverting it server side. And that means that we can change um, the way that we deal with the, the data without shipping and uptake woes. Um, so, the conceptual parts of it are the protocol, which is super simple and I'm going to talk about a bit. Um, then I'll talk a bit about how the data is divided into streams. I'm not going to talk about the client library at all, sorry. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the server side stuff. So the actual protocol is really quite trivial. Um, it is broken down, it, the data is broken down into events. The events have a namespaced type a bunch of headers which are just um, string key value pairs and a payload which is, which is optional and it's a, a JSON object which can contain structured nested data. Uh, data. Uh, and the, the type, it, it's intended to be namespace and it should be aimed to be understandable by people even if they're not on the tool team and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and the site mentioned here enables you to easily follow existing conventions when you're naming new stuff. So here's an example event. Um, we've got the type at the top, database.compared. Um, all those headers there are actually just standard ones that were added by the usage client library. That metadata section is stuff that was added um, when the event arrived server side, and then we've got a payload, so pretty, pretty simple. So, um, we've got three streams, um, so they all use the same trivial protocol. The streams are a way of essentially grouping data that have different properties, meaning and treatment. The telemetry one is very new and I'll mention that in passing in a bit. So these are two streams that are fairly unfortunately named. The product usage stream is about tracking high level value that specific contacts have got. 
Um, we show this information in Salesforce, again, hence why type names need to be carefully thought through. We push it to HubSpot to control automated nurturing um, for outbound, and BI cube this data with other related contact data. So the idea behind the stream is that we only need a few types per tool to determine things like renewal risk, to guide sales conversations, to automate nurturing, um, and hence types need to be thought through to avoid breaking those things or creating too much noise for those people. Uh, feature usage is more granular, but events here are still intended to indicate people getting value from the tools. Um, it has anonymous identities, so you can still do things, uh, you, you can still do user behavior analysis, you can still ask questions like, do, do people do X and then Y? Why don't they do Z afterwards? Or how many people are doing Z afterwards? And that sort of thing. You can follow the journey. But you don't get to know the exact con contacts involved. Um, telemetry is super new and it's intended to allow a much higher volume of data to be submitted and events don't necessarily need to be tied to user value. So the, the point of this stream is to help teams form metrics such that they can tune their, their tools in a, in a much more technically focused um, manner. Um, however, we won't be keeping or even processing all of the incoming data. So the idea here is that only a subset of the data is needed to update metrics immediately or we will form metrics from very recent data only. So the, uh, the usage client submits events to two, well, to subdomains per stream. Um, the API does some very basic um, validation. It can do filtering to chuck events away if needed. It can do some coercion. So coercion would be like the structure of an event has changed between versions of tools, or we need to change a name a bit because it wasn't very obvious, or we've captured something we shouldn't have and we need to scrub it. Um, that sort of thing. But ultimately, the API's goal is just get the events onto the message bus. Um, from there, events are streamed to various apps and places. Um, some apps do stream analytics, like the ones that update aggregated or summarized information in HubSpot and Salesforce. Um, the core dev portion of the system, though, provides no event sourcing. Instead, we push the events to third party systems for that and to BI for warehouse and cubing. Um, you can always join the message bus though if you want to do something more interesting. Uh, way too much text in this slide, I'm sorry. Ignore the text and listen to me maybe. <laughs> uh, this is basically just saying that Core Dev um, do keep an archive of the product and feature events that come in uh, in separate places, but they're, they're stored in a way that's not at all suitable for querying. Uh, instead, this is meant as an ingestion point for BI's warehouse on cubing, and it's a way for us to replay the stream if something bad were to happen or we need historic data in a new place. So finally, uh, a bit on GDPR. Um, so thanks to design, whenever we get asked to erase someone, we can just unmap their um, usage user ID that's present on the product usage events they submitted from the auth token that was originally handed to the tool from product login. That, so that's one row in a database that we keep at arm's length that we'd need to remove. Um, because that's the only identifying and sensitive data on the product usage events, it means that we, we get to keep all that now anonymous, all that, all that product usage now becomes anonymous and we get to keep it and we don't have to reprocess or rewrite an extensive product usage history because of a GDPR erasure. BI obviously have more work to do because they've, they've taken that data and they've combined it with a load of other stuff, so they have a lot more unpicking work to do. And don't get me wrong, Core Dev still has more erasure work to do in other parts of Rick's ecosystem, but one less gnarly problem. Um, I was expecting questions, so, because I know that was a lot of brain dump information. <coughs> Go for it. So just quick, what does cubed mean? Cubed. Uh, so if you so it's basically trying to make a multi-dimensional uh, database so that you try and de denormalize stuff so that it's really good for a wide range of queries. If that makes sense. 
Um, so, I, yeah, if you have any more questions on that, BI are well up on there on that, that sort of thing. But yeah, that's the general gist of it. Go for it. Guess what? <coughs> We've killed Mixpanel thanks to the prompting. Oh, have we? Probably turn that off. Yay! I was a double check with Amanda because she was just pulling the plug the other day. Sweet, cool. And Apple Insights have announced today that they're starting a two year retention policy instead of 90 days. Indeed. Hurrah. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Matt. Again, thank you, Matt. That was very interesting to hear about how cloud data is handled once it t turns up here. Uh, next up, we do have Nikolai talking about uh, feature toggles best practices. Right, I will be talking about feature toggles today. So, first of all, why? Um, why would you be even interested in this topic? Uh, the short answer would be that I think the, that this is something which is very relevant to what we are doing at the moment at Redgate, uh, like continuous integration. I see an interest at Redgate in adopting this practice, and I think that feature toggles is uh, is a tool that can help us to uh, to actually integrate much more frequently to the main branch. Experiments. Uh, we as a company are very experiments and data driven and I think uh, that feature toggles is a very powerful tool that can help us to take our experiments to the next level. Trunk based development. Uh, well, it's been general interest in trunk based development uh, both at Redgate and in the industry in general and uh, feature toggles is something which is really relevant to this code integration approach. Incremental delivery. Well, incremental delivery is not easy uh, and besides that, when releasing weekly or daily or even several times a day, uh, it's not entirely obvious how to actually release major versions of your software. Uh, last but not least, platform, which is uh, by definition as, some, as something which will combine our products into one single solution, will increase our needs in, uh, in tools which will help with dependencies. So, you might have heard of uh, feature toggles, feature flags, feature flippers, all of these are the same thing. Just essentially just a way to either switch a feature on always switch a feature off, as simple as that. But, important, not every single if in your code is a feature toggle. So why would you use feature toggles? First of all, to improve collaboration. Uh, things like, again, continuous integration, uh, truly independent releases, uh, no complex managers. This is something which uh, feature toggles can help with. By the way, the, f uh, the picture is supposed to represent people happy with chatting about something and not seeing them resolving 200 conflicts in XML files after the merge. Uh, to have better control over releases, uh, stuff like uh, incremental rollout or early access programs or synchronization of releases with marketing campaigns or even an ability to switch a feature off if it's problematic. Yeah. To be able to test in production, well, why would you need to do that, right? Because you, we need to test our software before we ship it to our users. Uh, well, yes and no, uh, because some stuff can only be checked in production and this is what A-B tests are for, right? Are there any risks? Of course there are. Um, for example, technical debt. Uh, obviously, additional stuff in your code base doesn't help with maintainability and makes your code more complex. Parallel changes. So if if a new feature is sitting dormant in, in your code uh, long enough behind the feature flag, chances are that in your existing code, which is 
which is invoked at the moment, you will need to modify it and you will need to uh, also copy these changes to the dormant part of the code, which is behind the feature flag, which in turn is easy to forget. Unnecessary abstractions. Uh, so this one is, uh, I understand this one is a bit controversial. So basically, if if done right, feature toggles are not just you know hundreds of ifs all over the code base. These are rather different implementations of of your abstractions. But if uh, the only reason for introducing these abstractions in the first place is just to enable feature toggling, well, I would say that it does does make your code look better, right? Because we want to keep it simple. The third release is. Um, so feature toggles uh, as a tool can can help us to deploy code, but without releasing it. And uh, with this with this possibility, it may be tempting to actually have less less frequent releases. And I'm sure all of you know which problems can it cause. So what can we do to actually benefit from feature toggles? First of all, decouple decision logic from decision points. If we ever need to change decision logic, we want to go to a single place, well, we can do that. As I said, avoid conditionals because a uh, much better way is to use such techniques as dependency injection and various Zen patterns like strategy. Have clear toggle names. Uh, this one is fairly obvious uh, because looking at the, at the feature toggle, you don't want to be confused whether it is switching the feature on or it is switching the feature off and what the feature is. Uh, expose current feature toggles configuration. Basically at any point in time uh, you want to know what are the current val values of, of the feature toggles that are being used. Um, one of the ways uh, to achieve that is for example to keep values in Git where you can also can see history of changes or if uh, you can control the environment where your application is running some sort of dashboard would also help. Communicate about feature toggles. Uh, well, the development team is not the only team which should know about feature toggles that are currently being used and the strategy around them. Other teams like support, marketing, etc. should also be aware of, of uh, these things. Um, avoid feature toggles if you can. So, uh, this may sound counterintuitive, right? Because uh, there are so many benefits from using them. But then again, this is something that increases complexity, makes code less maintainable. So if you can avoid them, please do. Much better approach would be to actually break down your delivery into smallest possible chunks to, to enable uh, frequent and independent releases. Don't build your own. Uh, so if your feature toggle feature toggles needs go beyond something trivial, well, chances are that someone has already built that, right? And uh, to be honest, there are companies that have built businesses around feature toggle solutions, so it should 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 give you an idea that it's not an easy thing to do. And uh, the last one, which is very important, retire feature toggles because. Essentially, a feature toggle is the way to separate uh, deployment from release. And once a feature is released, immediately a feature toggle becomes uh, obsolete and turned into, turns into technical debt. So remove them. Um, other thoughts. Not everything can be hidden using feature toggles. Stuff like complex refactoring or large tasks which um, uh, which span across different areas of code may be, may be challenging to hide from users behind the feature toggle. Uh, testing can be tricky because with lots of feature toggles uh, it's not entirely obvious which uh, tests to maintain and which combinations of these feature toggles to test. And a uh, cultural shift may be needed, you know, something similar to the Conway's law. <coughs> and that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. So, would you always expose these feature toggles to users, or would you would you give 
some sort of secret, such as a registry key location to certain beta testers and tell them this is how you turn on the, the feature? Uh, I don't think that feature toggles should be exposed to users because this, okay. this would turn them into a completely different concept to, so how, to how actually settings, right? On and off? Do you well, it's, uh, well, your options are limited in case of desktop applications, right? But in case of uh, environment which you control, like, you know, backend of a website, for example, mm -hmm. you can have a dashboard which you can also use not only, which can also not be used by developers only, but also by product managers, marketing specialists, etc., etc. So, yeah. Okay. No Thank you, Nicola. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, very interesting to hear about uh, how you should be using feature toggles. Uh, I know the change automation team have used them a few times. Uh, the team up in high roller uh, and the Autobots. So uh, Nicola probably got some information. They've probably got some. Please go talk to them. I would like again big thank you to all our speakers. Uh, thank thank you for coming. Thank you for watching on the stream.